It's time. It's time. Now it's time. Hey, everybody. Uh, how's it going? Welcome to uh, Open Space. Is there like a little bit of a delay with my face? Or is it like working okay? Weird. Hmm. We'll see if this, uh, if this is a problem um, or whether it's just uh, being delayed. Uh, anyway, uh, hey everyone, welcome to Open Space for September 21st, 2020. Uh, again, time has no meaning. Uh, tomorrow is yesterday, yesterday is tomorrow. It's one big wibbly wobbly, timey wimey uh, system. So, uh, anyway, uh, I hope you all have had an interesting week. So, there's one new thing that I just put into the schedule, which I hope you all see. We're going to do another episode of Open Space this week on Wednesday, Thursday. I don't remember the time. And that's because we have. Oh, there we go. Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And that's because uh, I'm letting the guest choose the time that they want to join me for the interview on Open Space. So it's going to be, I'm going to try to aim for one interview every week, but the time will be completely random. Uh, and I know that for some of you who like everything to be exactly the same week after week, uh, that's going to be a problem, but but I know that there are people who say live in Australia who can never see some of the earlier stuff. People who live in um, Europe who can never see some of the later stuff. And so I think with the guests, I want to make it as as convenient for them as possible. And so if I just define like we always do a guest interview on Thursdays at 5 p.m., then there will be a huge but never be able to interview people from Europe. So. This is going, this is my new plan, but we will see if it works. Totally random. Um, yeah, Horizon Brave. Oh boy, this is going to make a muck of my planned structured lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, for this one little part of your life, you're not going to be able to control it, and it's going to be all my fault. And I'm sorry. Uh, all right, so the other thing is, do I look a little out of focus? It's hard to focus with this camera, but I can, uh, eh, it's fine. It's fine. Um, uh, right, and then the other thing is we tried to start the virtual star party last Saturday, but we had a million various uh, technical problems plus the smoke. Nobody wanted to open up their telescopes with the chance of getting a little bit of smoke on your corrector plate and then having to scratch it. So um, it's going to be a total, totally different world. So we're going to wait another week, and hopefully we'll be able to do the virtual star party starting up on Saturday. All right. So let's get into uh, this week's uh, open space. As always, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, I'm ready. Uh, I'm sure many of you have a million questions about Venus. Um, we, I am tackling a whole bunch of the common questions that we got about Venus. That's going to be coming up in the next question show, which we will be releasing later on this week. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Were there any questions beforehand? Uh, Beth is saying that the <laughs> the um, the social media is going to be different. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, Beth. I apologize in advance. The uh, every part of this is going to be uh, mayhem, except we're going to have much better uh, guests. At and it's and you're, there's going to be one guest every week, so that's what you get. That's the bonus is we get really cool guests happening once a week. Uh, Zephan Zephan is asking, are the observatories still okay? So I don't know if you all saw what was happening last week. I think over the weekend, the fires in California reached the Wilson Observatory. And of course, that's where Hubble figured out how old, how, you know, how quickly everything in the universe is speeding away from us and really helped uncover the idea of the Big Bang. And and we saw these wildfires reach the observatories, and it was scary. You could see uh, in many of the cameras, they've got these live camera feeds. You could just watch the fire getting closer and closer and closer until finally it was uh, surrounding 
the observatory and it was just a nightmare. And what it turned out was that the, uh, the fire was being, uh, the, was being caused by backfires or being lit by the firefighters. And so actually it was the, it wasn't, didn't have anything to do with the, the fires actually making their way up to the observatories. It was that they were lighting uh, backfires to try to pr protect the observatories. And so in the end, the next morning, everything looked great. Um, there was still a little bit of smoke, but everything was pretty safe. So it felt good. Uh, yeah, so people are saying there's like an audio sync problem. I'm not sure how to fix that because I think it's local on my side. Um, I can switch my camera. It's a worse camera. Let's see. I can figure out what the problem is with that. So it's this. This is my other camera. Uh, is that more time time? No, it has an audio sync problem too. Weird. I don't know what the answer is. I'm sorry. Uh, Maybe I need to completely restart my computer. Uh, I'll try that next time. <laughs> yeah. Technology doesn't work. Yeah. Oh, people are saying it's a YouTube problem. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. So, all right. <laughs> Christian Woodland says, what do you think about the Russians claiming Venus is theirs? Uh, you can't, you can't claim, um, you can't claim Russia. Uh, you can't, you can't claim Venus. All right. Go back. The second one worked. Okay. I'll do that. We'll go back to the second one here. Hold on. All right. All right. This one. It's so tiny. Okay. All right. Uh, Apologies again. All right. Uh, yeah, white balance better with the second camera. Audio is good with either camera. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, it's bugging me. So you can see it's the clearly under my skin. All right. So let's talk about the Russians claiming Venus. Uh, that's nonsense. Uh, obviously, there's no way that Russia can claim that they own Venus. Obviously, the Russians did a tremendous amount to explore Venus. They had their whole Venera program through the 70s, 80s, where they put lander after lander into Venus. They all... Uh, crashed um, until they were finally able to make it down to the surface and survive for up to like an hour on the surface of Venus. They did an amazing job of exploring Venus and giving us many of our modern understanding about the conditions down at the surface of Venus. That said, you don't get to own Venus. Uh, you don't get to own any part of space. The Outer Space Treaty clearly says that nobody gets to own any part of space. Now, they could be saying like own like you know, we totally pwned Venus in that we were able to land spacecraft on the surface of, of Venus for like an hour. Take that Venus. Or maybe like they totally own Venus. Like, like they're known for exploring Venus. It's their domain. So that's fine. Go ahead. I mean, maybe it's just a bad translation. Arjun asks, how much life are we talking about on Venus? If we set a probe that we could actually get some life, or would it be too sparse? We don't know. Uh, right now, the amount of phosphine that's been detected in the atmosphere of Venus is 20 parts per billion, which is not a lot. Uh, so you would definitely need to have some kind of spacecraft that is capable of of gathering an enormous amount of material from the atmosphere of Venus, condensing it down, and then using that to be able to actually um, test out, like, like, like bring a sample home. And so you would be looking for just like gathering an enormous amount of material, dumping a ton of it overboard until you've got some gigantic sample of the atmosphere and then bringing that home to try to test. But it, I think it would be pretty difficult to to detect life locally with some kind of spacecraft that that the amount of atmosphere that you would need to pr to process now it might be that you could set up some kind of machine that is sucking in atmosphere and and concentrating it and looking for very specific biomarkers for the for the bacteria but i just i, I just have a tough time imagining some balloon being capable of gathering samples of drops of 
of sulfuric acid with little droplets of water mixed in and then being able to sample those droplets to be able to determine if there is indeed uh, any kind of bacterial life. Like you'd need to have like a microscope on it and it would need to produce slides and squish them on little pieces of glass. So uh, yeah, that would be, that would be tricky. Uh, Andy Gravity notes is can I ask something in Spanish? My English not so good. Sure. Uh, my Spanish is not so good though. So hopefully somebody can translate it. Um, so uh, use nord asks, are you, are there actually missions being planned or changed based on the phosphine findings? So up until the big announcement, uh, you know, we had reported on a couple of spacecraft that were already planning to go to Venus to do some kind of atmospheric examination. Uh, they were going to send some kind of, uh, like the, the next Venera program, the one that the Soviets or the Russians are working on, they were going to have a U.S. built atmospheric probe on board that was going to be dropped into the atmosphere and it would float down and take samples through the atmosphere for as long as it could until it reached the surface. So not hanging out for long periods of time, but also NASA has a couple of missions in the works, which would be balloon based missions, some even cooler ideas that would be like um, manta rays that would fly around in the atmosphere of Venus. But the main idea is a is a balloon that can change its altitude going up and down through the atmosphere by sort of like a submarine changing the volume of gas that it's carrying around it. The Indians are also working on a uh, atmospheric probe. And so you can imagine that that all of these probes before they would have had to have battled for funding in the, you know, in the Thunderdome, the way that's how it works, I believe. Uh, so, but in this case, now I think you're going to see that, that, that these missions will get funded fairly quickly, fairly easily. So it's going to be a different, um, uh, funding, a different grant environment than it was before. There's a couple of private firms as well that are looking into this. And we know that Breakthrough, the Breakthrough Initiative, of course, the people behind Breakthrough Starshot, they're thinking of funding a mission. And then actually um, uh, Rocket Lab was working on a very small spacecraft that they were thinking of sending to Venus. And now suddenly we find out that it's uh, a good time to send it. And maybe they had some advanced knowledge. Uh, Curious Borg, why is it such a big deal that Venus has phosphine and no biggie that Saturn has it? Yeah, well, you would expect to find phosphine in a hydrogen-rich environment, and that's what Jupiter and Saturn are. They're mostly made of hydrogen, so it's not a surprise to find three hydrogen atoms mashed onto a phosphorus atom in a place that's almost entirely hydrogen. But hydrogen is a very reactive gas. It wants to, to, to go to oxygen the moment that it can. And so when you have an environment like Earth or Venus, um, you've got a tremendous amount of oxygen. Of course, carbon dioxide, it's, you know, it's got twice the oxygen there in every carbon dioxide atom. And hydrogen will be glad to go in and suck away that oxygen and form water. And so you wouldn't expect to see phosphine for long periods of time in a oxygen rich environment. So that's why it's so exciting. And then so then the question is, what is the the process that's producing it? And the one process is some kind of life. And then the other process is some abiotic process that we don't know of. And phosphine has been known for a long time. We know that 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 this one chemical has been well studied. People understand the process, how it gets created both through biology and also through non-biology. And so either people are going to discover an entirely new way that phosphine is created non-biologically, which would be actually very exciting. And, and I think the largest thing is, is that, that we get a chance to study a biosignature on a nearby world in a way that we can actually rule it out as a biosignature. So you come up with this idea, here's this chemical that, that, should not exist in large quantities in a oxygen rich environment that doesn't have lots of volcanism and, and lots of, you know, some other process that's generated from factories producing phosphine. And then you have to figure out, well, is it really a biosignature? And of course we're really lucky because now it's been found on Venus. And so it's very close. And so you can send a spacecraft over to Venus and you can double check all of these findings to say, 
Is there really phosphine in these concentrations if you actually measure it locally? Is the phosphine, you know, can we trace the story of phosphine on Venus? Um, and so this is, this is what's going to happen is that spacecraft will be sent, air, balloons will be sent, and they'll be trying to trace the story of phosphine just the way they're tracing the story of water on Mars. And it gives you a much better way to find out if indeed phosphine is a proper biosignature. And then when we see phosphine in the atmospheres of other extrasolar planets, now uh, we've got a much better case to make that yes, indeed, we, we have been trying for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years to find any ex explanation for why phosphine could be found in the atmosphere of a planet. And we can't find any other than it has life. And we've checked. We've gone to Venus, we've scoured it, and we found life, or didn't find life, or whatever. So that's why I think they will, um, that's why they're doing it. So I think it's, it's great. It just, however this turns out, it's incredibly exciting. Uh, Vulcan the Conqueror. Will future nuclear spaceships do a flyby of Jupiter or Saturn and suck up some hydrogen for fuel? Um, well, the problem with Saturn and Jupiter is that they have really big gravity wells. And as you know, gravity wells are for suckers. And so if you try to dip into a gravity well, you are facing uh, a really tough slog to make your way back out of the gravity well again. And there's been some ideas that you would be able to sort of fly down, skim the top of the atmosphere, fly back out, do another skim, just peek keep picking up t tiny amounts of, of hydrogen. But there's much better sources of hydrogen out there in the solar system. For example, water. You, know, you look at places like Europa, Enceladus, and those are gravity wells. Look at comets. Once you get out beyond the asteroid belt, then you're going to have objects that are largely made of frozen water and water is made of hydrogen. And so for the longest time, if we ever do build fusion drives, you know, like, we can't make fusion work on Earth yet. So let's imagine that we make fusion work on Earth. Then we're able to make fusion smaller so that it works in space. Then we're able to figure out a way to gather up hydrogen from the, from the solar system, from comets, from asteroids, things like that, and then make our fusion drive go. So there's a chain of events there, but I wouldn't go for Jupiter and Saturn in the beginning. I would go for places that have no gravity well to contend with to start with. And the, the gravity on Jupiter is the worst. It's like 10 times, like the, I think the force of gravity on Jupiter is like 10 times what it is on Earth. Like it's really bad gravity. You don't want to go anywhere near Jupiter, ever. Like just like take the gravity wells are for suckers times 10. <laughs> More bash. Does life really find a way? It really does, apparently. But we'll find out. Like, if life can find a way on Venus, then life really does find a way. Because the if there is this life on Venus, it is it has evolved to survive in an environment that that we don't have any corresponding version of that here on on Earth. We don't know. Like you take the environment of the, sul the the concentration of the sulfuric acid and no life on earth, and even our toughest, like even water bears, they just fold and die. And yet somehow, if this is possible, then there is life in an, in an environment that's so hostile. And that's why people are super worried about, you know, are we going to infect Venus with earth life? But the reality is, is that, is that we can't, we have no life that can survive those kinds of conditions that we know of. Um, and so any life that we tried to send there would just die a horrible death as it entered the Venusian atmosphere and experienced the temperature and pressure and sulfuric acid. Um, J. Broder, which is first, thermal cooling or depressurization to terraform Venus? Um, so <laughs> terraforming Venus. Yeah, so if you want to terraform Venus, you know, once you've got your fusion drive and you're regularly flying into the, atm the upper atmosphere of Jupiter and, and pulling away its uh, precious, precious hydrogen, uh, you're going to start terraforming Venus. And so the way that's been proposed to terraform Venus is to essentially block the light from the sun. And you block the light from the sun, you cool down Venus to well below freezing, well below the temperature that's required 
for um, for carbon dioxide to fall out of the atmosphere like snow. And then so the entire atmosphere of Venus just rains down like snow. And now suddenly it doesn't have a thick atmosphere anymore. It has no atmosphere. And then you have to somehow get rid of that atmosphere. You have to lock it up with something. So there are various chemicals that will readily lock up with, hydro, with, with carbon dioxide. Things like magnesium, um, uh, Oh, like the cliffs of Dover. So uh, there are, um, oh man, what's the chemical? Anyway, there's a couple of chemicals that you can use. But you need a lot of it because there's a lot of this carbon dioxide on Venus in that atmosphere that you have to sequester into, like to make limestone essentially. And you need other chemicals to be able to do that. So um, you can theoretically make, you can sequester the 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 carbon using life organically. You can have bacteria feeding on the carbon dioxide, but you need hydrogen to be able to do it and like a lot of hydrogen. And so you need to somehow supply Venus with either hydrogen to then allow bacteria to lock away the, the carbon dioxide into something that, so it won't just turn into an atmosphere again. Or you need some other chemical like magnesium or whatever it is in calcium. You need calcium or magnesium to lock away the carbon dioxide into something like limestone. And then you can then take your big sunshade away from Venus and allow the, um, uh, the temperature to increase and the atmosphere won't just pop back out. Yeah, thank you. Calcium. All right. Um, Orion Dreams. Uh, Fraser, how credible do you find David Fravers' Pentagon Tic Tac UFO videos and story? Um, it's good. I, I listened to a great episode on that with um, uh, the, man, what was the, po- it was a recent podcast that I was listening to, and there was a long interview, like a three-hour interview with him. We went into tremendous detail about his history as a pilot. Uh, it sounds great. He sounds like a very, um, very knowledgeable, very skilled, very no-nonsense pilot who is very good at recognizing what he, what he was looking at, and he was didn't know what he was looking at. He thought it moved very quickly. Uh, that all sounds great. Um, it sounds like literally the very definition of an unidentified flying object. There you go, Lex Friedman. That was the podcast. Yeah, Lex Friedman. So I was listening to the Lex Friedman podcast. It was great. Yeah, it's the very definition of an unidentified flying object. And so it is unidentified. Flying and object. is it, it really is all three of those things. Unfortunately, until we can know what it is, then it will have to remain as unidentified. And you can't assert that it's something. Well, it, it has to be a secret weapons project by the Soviets, or it has to be a, or the Russians, or it has to be a, um, it has to be aliens. You can't say that because you have to, that's an assertion that you have to make a positive assertion. You have to gather more evidence. And so until that point, we just have to say it is an unidentified flying object. I've also seen some great um, analysis of mathematicians looking at the trajectories of various things. Um, and being able to say, well, that, that was obviously like, wasn't moving as quickly as people thought in the infrared camera, things like that. So, uh, more evidence is necessary. I'm, I, the great thing about science is that evidence is what is required to change people's minds. So more evidence, please. Um, uh, TP Seeker, China has rovers on the moon. Are they releasing pics or videos? If where can we see them? Yeah, do a search. It's the Chinese rover. It's called the Chang'e 3, Chang'e 4. Uh, so just do a search for Chang'e 4 rover. And actually, China does a really good job of releasing the pictures and the science papers that go along with the, um, uh, to go along with this, with the rover. They're releasing lots of pictures from the surface of the moon. It's good. Not video, I don't think, but definitely lots of pictures. So they've been doing a much better job of, of being more transparent for us as science journalists trying to report on what they're doing. It's so tough to be able to report on, on their missions because 
they don't put a lot of it available to the public. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why I'm learning to read simplified Chinese and be able to speak Mandarin so that I can just understand what's going on with a country that is doing a tremendous amount of of space exploration, launching rockets, and is going to be a major player in the future of, of human space exploration. Uh, Bill Sugden, have you seen any parallel Nick videos on the history of astronomy? I haven't. I, people always ask me, like, have you seen this? Have you seen that? Like, I don't really get a chance to watch a lot of, of other YouTubers. I've mentioned this in the past. You know, I know some people, you know, I've done some like collaborations. I've done some stuff with, with Isaac Arthur and with John Michael Godier and, and, but I don't get really get a lot of time to watch other people's work. I try to, but I also don't want to get influenced by their style and by what they're saying. I, even just watching it a little bit, it sort of sinks into your brain and affects the way you want to present information on a topic. And so I try to consume as little as possible of people who are directly talking about the kinds of things that, that I'm talking about. Trey Harmon, has anybody watched Away yet? We were really impressed with it. Yeah, I've watched, uh, Carl and I watched Away. I have feelings, I have mixed feelings. On the one hand, I found it very technically accurate. I had a really hard time finding any technical issue with the show at all. And normally, like, that's my hobby, right? Is rolling my eyes and going, come on, that wouldn't work. It wouldn't be like that. I was just like, my eyes were glued to the screen. I was trying to find any problem that I could, and I couldn't find problems. So whoever was the um, the helper, whoever was the science advisor on the show, did a great job. At the same time, um, I was, I found the the communications delays were handled poorly. So even when they were at the moon, they should have had a three second delay in talking. Um, and then as they got farther and farther from the earth, the delay would stretch out until you're almost at Mars and you're looking at a you know, three to six minute delay every time you want to talk. But the part that was really bad was just how unprofessional and unprepared the crew of astronauts were to deal with the kinds of situations that they had to deal with. And that's what I found, like when you watch The Martian and Matt Damon is dealing with all of these really complicated problems and so are the people in space, they are consummate professionals and they are capable dealing with extreme situations and you find them and and that was sort of exciting to see people who are very skilled at what they do deal with unbelievably complicated and dire scenarios with professionalism and capability it's a pleasure to watch a show make that happen and what they did instead was they went the other way, which was to say, like, let's have these people have these bad dynamics, internal dynamics. Let's, 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 they were like spoiled school children. That's one, that's the way someone described it. And, and obviously they wanted to set that up to make the drama happen, but I didn't think it was the, it's not the, I found it very annoying. So in the end, I found the show fine. I watched it and and I enjoyed it overall, but that almost killed it for me. Um, let's see. <laughs> Omni Tatum, what is the true all time best rocket fuel of all time and why does not NASA use it if it doesn't? What makes the best rocket fuel and how? Uh, Unfortunately, there's no one best all-time rocket fuel. There's different rocket fuels for different purposes. Um, like liquid hydrogen and oxygen are very powerful, but you have to keep them cooled down. They're very complicated and difficult to work with. Uh, solid rocket boosters are very easy to work with, but you can't turn them off. They're very powerful. Um, and they, as we saw, they can be very dangerous when they work with, they also have fairly harmful chemicals. There are, uh, chemicals like, um, hydrazine. There's chemicals that are very good, very useful, very stable at, at, at room temperature, but are incredibly toxic. Um, there are very efficient 
pro propellants like ion engines, which can take you to tremendous speeds, but they don't work on the earth. You need to have, you know, can only start firing them when you're out in space. Um, so there's right now, there isn't really like a best propellant, best rocket fuel. Um, otherwise everybody would just use the same rocket fuel, but there's different kinds of propellant work in different ways at different times. So I think we will, uh, we'll see, uh, there's a, like one very good propellant is the hydrogen blasted out of the back of a nuclear rocket, but people don't want to blast nuclear rockets inside the earth's atmosphere. They're very powerful, very efficient, but you need to use them outside. So. <laughs> Zach Perry, who'd win in a space off? You or Phil Plate? Uh, Phil. Phil would win. Yeah. The guy's an, an actual PhD astronomer. But it'd be fun. Yeah, I'd, I'd, do, a, I'd do a space trivia with Phil if, he, if he's up for it. Um, whoa. Pray for Mojo. NASA's InSight probe on Mars found a 30-second window of seismic activity when Phobos eclipses the sun. I hadn't even heard about that. Can you give me a link to that? That's cool. James T., what is the largest aperture telescope that you've looked through? I've looked through a 22-inch Dobsonian telescope with my eyeball. And and my advice for, for getting telescopes like I really don't recommend that people use big telescopes because they're like, you have to stand on a step ladder to look through the eyepiece of the telescope. And so if you want to get better views of the sky, keep a small telescope like that, but put a camera on the back of it so that you can start to see stuff just in the, like take long exposure pictures is as good as a bigger telescope. But I gotta say, <laughs> A 22 inch telescope was pretty amazing. Um, there's something like there to a certain point, an eight inch telescope, a 10 inch telescope, like Andromeda nebulae, they just look like a little fuzzy cloud. But once you get, yeah, 22 inch telescope, you're starting to see the green in the middle of the ring nebula with your own eye. You're starting to see the spiral nature of galaxies. You're starting to see some of that, that fainter stuff. So it, so it comes, <laughs> comes around the other side. I gotta say, um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool, but I mean like totally impractical. Uh, Bim Jim, is it a valid scientific hypothesis that nearby parallel universes exist? Um, all right, so I need to, I need to like parse your entire question. Uh, is it a valid scientific hypothesis that nearby parallel universes exist? So, so the, I, there are many kinds of parallel universes that you can have, and some are almost certain. So I'll give you one example, right? If we have an infinite universe, then any one part of the universe is repeated an infinite number of times. We've talked about this quite a bit. Therefore, any part of the universe is essentially repeated an infinite number of times. Therefore, uh, this, the Earth, the solar system, the entire Milky Way is repeated an infinite number of times, and this exact conversation is happening an infinite number of, of times. And that is a, a parallel universe that is inside this one universe. In fact, if you wait long enough, just you just wait. So that so that's just like spatially there's there's a parallel there are an infinite number of parallel universes within our universe. But you can also do that with time. So if you just wait long enough, the atoms in the universe will randomly rearrange themselves just through quantum mechanics into new structures, some of which will be the universe if you wait long enough and so if so not only sort of through space can you have parallel universes but through time you can have parallel universes just wait long enough this exact moment will appear instantaneously and everyone will think that we've always been here and that's just one of the the implications of of an infinite amount of time into the future um but then one of the implications of, you know, to explain, say, quantum mechanics is that one possible explanation is that there are new universes being hived off every time 
that there is a choice that needs to be made. And it fully explains, it fully answers why quantum mechanics works the way that it does, uh, ex fully explains spooky action at a distance, quantum entanglement, etc. It just seems super weird to have these things appearing that other universes, entire universes appearing. But there's no reason to believe that we would ever be able to interact with them in any way, shape, or form. Um, one of the implications of inflation is that in the early universe, you had an infinite number of universes all unfolding simultaneously in their own little, in their own little bubble. And some were expanding at different speeds than others. And so if inflation is all the evidence is gathered to show that inflation is a real thing, then the, the implication of that is that there are parallel universes separated because of inflation. So there are so many different ways that you can describe it. Many of them are, so are there parallel us's in this universe if it's infinite? Are there, will there be parallel us's into the future if time is infinite? Um, are there parallel universes if the many worlds hypothesis of quantum mechanics is true, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a bunch of, of possible um, implications of, of parallel universes and all of them require more evidence and probably all of them imply that we will never be able to reach them. We will never be able to go to them. We will just be able to prove mathematically that they exist. Caleb guitar covers. Do you think there's life on another planet in our solar system, such as Venus? Oh, it's new to our channel. Um, so my opinion is that there is probably no life in the solar system, but if we do find life that we will be related to it. So, so my feeling, and this is just like, this is not science. This is just my, this is just like my gut is that is that, that the discovery of life on Venus or the phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus will turn out to be a, turn out to be a abiotic process that we just didn't know about yet. That there will be some mechanism where you've got, um, you know, some way that volcanic processes happening down on the surface are making their way up to the high atmosphere of Venus, or that there is some way that sunlight is interacting with the chemicals in the atmosphere of Venus that the researchers just, they, they took every way that we know of, and there was just a way that they didn't know of that it turns out is possible. Some way that sulfuric acid interacts with, I don't know, I don't know. Um, that seems more likely to me. And that's what they're saying too. I mean, they're saying, please figure out why we're wrong, figure out why this chemical that shouldn't be there is there. And, and so my feeling is, is that it's going to, in the end, turn out to be not life. Um, and that when we look on Mars, we're not going to find life. When we look on Europa and Enceladus, we're not going to find life. And that we're not going to find life when we search with SETI and we're not going to find life when we use of telescopes to scan the atmospheres of, of other planets orbiting other stars, that we are alone in the universe. That's, that's what I feel. <laughs> Curious Borg says, but is there phosphine in your gut? Yeah, there is phosphine in my gut, weirdly. So, you know, we know that for sure. Uh, so that's my, that's my personal opinion. And that's because I find the, the Fermi paradox such a compelling concept, but, but I think it's super important for us to look like it's the most important thing, most important question that we can ask in science is, are we alone in the universe? In my opinion right now. So, so I'm definitely not saying we should just like, that's it. We don't know. Uh, there's no life. Like we should look. Robert McPherson, uh, so if you could personally meet any historical figure in astronomy and physics, who would be most honored and interested to meet? Galileo, Newton, Einstein, Carl Sagan. Uh, so uh, not Newton. You sound like a jerk. Uh, Einstein's busy. No, the one that I've always mentioned is Galileo. I would love to talk to Galileo. That would be incredible because he was the first person to point his telescope at space. And suddenly he could resolve stars in the Milky Way. Suddenly he saw moons orbiting around Jupiter. He saw that Venus went through phases, which was 
which was predicted. Like just by looking at Venus and seeing that it went through phases, he immediately proved the heliocentric model of the solar system. Like he just looked at it and was like, oh, okay, yep. Everything goes around the sun, just like that. And, and even same thing, like to see moons going around Jupiter, he instantly saw that something else was going around um, another, another planet. So, uh, so, and then, but I, but he would have so many questions and it would be so fascinating to talk with him and just, and just to let him just can you imagine a QA session where he, I could just synthesize everything that we know about the universe. He would just, it would be, it'd be a ball. It'd be so much fun. Now I have to learn old style Italian to Cesar Jean. Uh, Arjun says, when you're researching for a story, do you actually contact the scientists involved? Yeah, of course. I'm a journalist. That's our job is to talk to the scientists. Um, so pretty much it's the default for every story that we work on on Universe Today that whoever, whichever reporter is working on the story tries to reach out to the scientists. Uh, it depends on, on how open and shut the story is. Like if we're just reporting on a new launch for SpaceX, or if we're reporting on a very well done press release, then we typically don't bother. But if you see on Universe Today, we're often covering stories that nobody else is covering. And that's because we're actually finding scoops, we're finding interesting papers, and we're reaching out to the to the scientists who are writing those papers and asking them for additional um, you know, asking them for additional insight into what they're looking into. So yeah, absolutely. We, we talk to scientists all the time. It's, it's, I mean, that's one of the great things about this is that you can just, I mean, I'm at this point, utterly unafraid, like to, to reach out to anybody. You like, Oh, I want to know, uh, why this is the way it is. I'm going to call an astronaut. And I just do because I can. And, um, and it's great to be able to get their insights and get their additions to what we're doing. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that for a lot of people, they feel scared, like just write an email. These people are not as busy as you think. And as long as you're quick and you, um, you write an email that, that, you know, you're not like writing some big, long thing. You just like say, uh, did you rule out this? And they go, yes, we ruled out that. And then you can quote them in your article. So it's great. Um, Verdadero. Hey, Fraser, how can we be certain Earth will not be hit by an asteroid? What are the chances that we miss the next major impact? Um, uh, how can we be certain that Earth will not be, Earth will be hit by an asteroid? So let me see if I remember my numbers right. So every five years or so, the Earth is hit by a like seven meter asteroid which releases the amount of damage of like a Hiroshima and every uh, hundred years, 1300 years, every 1300 years, earth is hit by a 60 meter asteroid, which releases like a 10 megaton bomb. Um, and there are about a thousand one kilometer bigger asteroids, which if they hit the earth would cause damage and they hit like once every 500,000 years and they would cause like a very significant event. So the good news is, um, NASA has, has been able to map out, uh, all of the one kilometer asteroids, the thousand or so potentially hazardous objects and have ruled out any of them being able to hit us. But anything smaller than that, we don't know where they all are. And it is just a matter of time until they, we get smashed by one of them. Um, and that's why something like say the Vera Rubin observatory is so important that will single-handedly find pretty much all of the, anything above about 140 meters across is a significantly concerning space rock. And Vera Rubin will be able to find most of them within a couple of years. So, um, yeah. So don't, 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 uh, you know, it's just a matter of when, not a question of if, but the chances of it happening any specific year are very low. You know, your, your chance of dying in an asteroid strike are incredibly low, but when a big one comes, we all die together. Um, a space cadet. Who's the most famous science person who knows you? I don't know. 
I don't know. Um, you, I don't. I have no idea who knows me. Um, tell me, the uh, famous people who know me. <laughs> All right. Pavel Zersky, when Lisa is launched, what will it be able to detect? Will it be able to take to sense gravitational waves from beyond the microwave background? So for those of you who don't know, Lisa is the follow-on mission to the Lisa Pathfinder, and this is going to be a space-based gravitational wave observatory. It's going to be an interferometer, so you're going to have these three... Um, satellites that are flying in formation. They're going to be firing lasers back and forth at each other, and they're going to very carefully measure the distance to them. And then as a gravitational wave rolls over between them, they will move farther apart and move back together, and they will be able to, de they'll be able to detect the power of the gravitational wave that moved through. And it will be far more sensitive than anything that we will have currently on the ground and probably like the greatest most powerful gravitational wave observatory that's in the works on the ground is probably going to have arms in about the 40 um, kilometer length and the LISA will go well beyond that. So the thing that you're asking about is the, the gravitational wave uh, observatory, sorry the gravitational waves that are left over from the formation of the Big Bang itself. And in theory, just like we're seeing the cosmic microwave background radiation, there are gravitational waves that are rippling through space-time left over from the moment the universe formed. And LISA should just maybe be able to detect those gravitational waves. But there's a follow-on observatory called the Big Bang Observer, which is going to take LISA and then attach like another three uh, spacecraft to it, maybe even more, maybe up to 12, and make a constellation of these things. And that should be capable of detecting those, those gravitational waves, the primordial gravitational waves that were created when the Big Bang happened, which is incredible. Um, Ronald Minch maybe at a convention. That's cool. Um, uh, Space Cadet, the most famous science guy I know is Fraser Cannon. And I know you, Space Cadet, so there you go. Um, Jay Broder, have, do we perform any recent measurements to measure or map the Van Allen Belt's radiation strength? Yeah, there is a mission that's up right now by NASA, and I forget the name of it, but it is a Van Allen Belt's specific mission that is, um, that is in orbit. I think they just wrapped up the mission just within the last year. And one of the cool things that it found, we did an episode on this, but there's lots of like flat earth or hate comments in the mission, but in the, in the episode, we talked about the, the Van Allen belts and that they were able to um, find a third Van Allen belt that appeared uh, during a time of solar activity. And they appeared a sort of change in their strength quite quite often they they react to the effect of the solar wind as the solar wind gets stronger the earth's magnetosphere puffs up and changes its shape in response and so the actual shape of the of the van allen belts changes depending on the solar weather and so this is one of the reasons why we've got there's so much interest in measuring the solar weather is when humans start flying to space and they go out beyond the protective magnetosphere of the earth, we're going to want to go in times where there isn't a lot of activity, where the Van Allen belts aren't being pushed and made, where they have to spend more time going through the belts than, than, than less time. So uh, yeah, I apologize. I don't know the name of the, of the spacecraft, but I did an episode all about the Van Allen belts. Again, just look for the one that has a million flat earthers arguing about, about radiation and temperature in space. James Leon, are you worried about Starlink, et cetera, skewing up Vera Rubin's view? Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Starlink's, like, Starlink is going to be a minor nuisance to most astronomers, but the one telescope that's going to get the absolute worst of it is going to be the Vera Rubin Observatory. And because Vera Rubin is going to have probably multiple Starlink passes going through every single picture that it takes, uh, it's... Uh, it's going to be rough. So am I worried about it? I mean, it, what it's going to do is it's going to degrade the overall quality of the sciences coming out of the Vera Rubin Observatory. So every image that they take 
It's going to have starling trails passing through it, and they're going to have to ignore the data that's running along that trail. And so they took a picture, and maybe there was a supernova in that galaxy. Maybe there was an asteroid moving through that field of view. And if that trail runs right through it, then it's, it's going to degrade the data. And, and you don't sort of think of it on a case-by-case -case basis. You just think about it at a, as an overall source of noise that's going into the quality of the pictures that are coming out of it. So, yeah, I think it's, it's going to be a problem. That's the one telescope that's going to get the brunt of it. And it's too bad because, as I've been going on for years, the Vera Ruin Observatory is the most exciting telescope, the one I'm most looking forward to, and the one that that I think is going to provide the most benefit to astronomy in the near term. It's going to find those dangerous asteroids. It's going to find us planet nine. It's going to show us all of this. It's going to help us see all of the supernovae that will help us figure out how fast the universe's expansion is changing. It'll help us find dark energy. It's going to help find Kuiper belt objects. Like it's just, it's going to be such an exciting telescope and it's not long, like it's like a year away before it sees first light. So uh, I'm so excited. But does that mean that I think Starlink shouldn't have launched? Um, I think that the promise of high speed internet access to people in remote locations is one of the most valuable things that could be brought to humanity. So, so if high speed internet is provided to people at a low cost around the world, then it's worth it to degrade our science. Um, but if high speed internet is brought to allow stock traders to make more money, then it wasn't worth it. And the way what should have happened was as they were planning this and as they were getting regulations, someone should have said, um, what's your plan for making high speed internet access available to the world? How much is it going to cost? What do you promise? And Starlink should have said, here's what we promise. We promise that anybody on earth can get a Starlink receiver and high speed internet for less than $50, $50 a month, or, you know, it's going to be whatever is some price. And they should have held them to that and said, you can't launch satellites unless you sign on the dotted line that you're going to provide that level of service. And it's not just going to be for rich people. So that didn't happen. So here we are, horse barn already open. And hopefully, in the end, it will provide that solution. But right now, there's no guarantee. So, um, Let's see. Uh, Arjun asks, why can gravitational waves be seen for so far away? Um, I think that mid-sized black hole was billions of light years away. Because they're very powerful. You have black holes smashing into black holes. So it creates a lot of energy. Um, Bill Sugden, what are the chances for LUVAR next decadal survey? I don't know, but we've got some interviews with the people from LUVAR that we're going to produce a video on, so I will learn as I write it. Uh, but let's, we'll get some interviews on the channel with some people from LUVAR and each of the new great observatories. I, you know, I've got all these contacts and we should get them to talk about it. Estevan Kandel, any possibility of bringing samples from the Venus atmosphere? Yeah, in theory, you could do a sample return mission from Venus. You would send a spacecraft to Venus with a rocket on board. It would enter the atmosphere of Venus. It would float around like a balloon. And then when it had gathered up its samples, it would put them onto the rocket. And then the rocket would launch from the balloon and return to Earth. So theoretically, we have the technology to be able to do that. So just someone's got to have the will. Um, there's a mission you may want to take a look at called Havoc, and this was an idea that um, that there that you would essentially send a, a blimp with with human astronauts to Venus, and they'd float around in Venus, and then it was time to come home. They'd hop in their rocket and they'd return. I mean, keep in mind that if you're in Venus, you're in a gravity well that's essentially as powerful as Earth's, and you don't have solid ground to be able to launch from. So um, imagine you're in a rocket. Uh, and the rocket has to fall into Venus, going towards the ground, and the rocket has to fire, uh, and then be able to carry you out of the atmosphere of Venus, fighting against as bad a gravity well as, as Earth. So uh, there's challenges to be able to do it. 
Um, curious board with hundreds of Starlink and competitor satellites going up. Will this make travel to and from orbit dangerous from a collision standpoint? Will someone eventually be struck by one? Uh, <clears throat> it, they don't have to be. So there are the Starlink satellites are going to go in very specific orbits. They're in these lines and the lines are have altitude in between them. So space is big. And so as long as you steer clear of those of those lines of those highways of where the satellites are going, the chances of you running into any object is very low. And in many cases, you launch from very specific launch sites from from Cape Canaveral or from uh, the Baikonur Cosmodrome or wherever they're launching from in China. So it's pretty safe uh, to be able to do that. Um, but if there are impacts, if we get higher up impacts, then you could imagine that it is actually a bit of a risk. But for now, no, it's it's fine. Um, all right, we've reached almost the end. Let's see, there's got to be like another couple of questions here. Let's see. Um, Pray for Mojo. Do we have any updates on the James Webb Space Telescope? I'm actually going to be bringing on some people from James Webb on this channel, and we'll talk to them about that. Uh, we talked about someone from the engineering side, but I want to talk to someone from the astronomy side just about what the capabilities of James Webb are going to be. So we'll, that's going to be happening in, in a couple of weeks. Um, the, but, you know, is it going to launch? Um, you know, yes, it's going to launch. Uh, we're, we're, it's so close at this point. It's, it's packed up in a box and it's ready to go. Uh, so we're still, at this point now, it's like a year away from launch. And I, I, I'm sure there's a chance that it'll slip farther, but each time it slips, it's a more complete telescope when it slips. So maybe 2026? I, I, I think it'll launch next year. I would be surprised if it makes the launch window of, of November, October. Not that I know anything, but just things take longer than you think, but apart from that. All right, we've reached the end of our of our hour. Uh, thank you everybody for hanging out with me. This was a lot of fun, great questions. Uh, we've got another question show coming out this week. We've got a episode on a Titan submarine that we're working on. Um, and of course we've got a guest on Thursday, Sarah Scholes, who is a science journalist, works for Popular Science, Wired, and has written a new book all about how the UFOs why we see UFOs, which I think some of you are going to love and some of you are going to hate. All right. So we'll see you on Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific. All right. And then, of course, we've got the Weekly Space Hangout on Wednesday and the new Astronomy Cast on Friday. So buckle up. And the new Virtual Star Party on Saturday. So I always say buckle up. Be prepared. We'll see you later.